Hello everyone, this is Enrique Bakemeyer with Healthcare Business Insights, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Thought Leadership Webinar, hosted by PMMC and featuring the Metro Health System, How to Negotiate with Payers, the Four Key Components of Contracting. As noted on slide two, you will have the opportunity to ask questions during the webinar by typing them in the space provided in the open Q&A field on the right-hand side of the screen. We will take a couple of brief pauses to field questions on slides 19 and 23, and again at the conclusion of the webinar. If you need assistance at any point during the webinar, please call our client engagement team at 888-700-5223 for personal attention. As always, today's program is being recorded and registered attendees will receive a copy of the presentation by email within the next couple of days. Here are the learning objectives for today's session. Assess all contract terms of base agreement and its amendments. Determine contract performance benchmarks based on analysis of available data. And establish targets and timeframes for negotiations to achieve desired results without patient disruption. Before we turn it over to our speakers, let's just spend a few minutes reviewing some HBI research on the subject of today's webinar and also launch today's first in-conference poll. What best describes your confidence level in negotiating pair contracts at your organization? The answers are confident in our strategy and the modeling tools, confident in our strategy but limitations with the modeling tools, unsure of our strategy but confident in the modeling tools, or strategy and tools need improvement. Again, that question was, what best describes your confidence level in negotiating pair contracts at your organization? Confident in both strategy and tools, confident in strategy, not so much in tools, not so confident in strategy, but confident in tools, or not so confident in either. So before we go any further, I just want to make a quick note on CPE credits for this and upcoming Academy webinars and virtual conferences. In the past, we've asked the question about, do you want to receive CPE credits for attending the event on the registration form? And in fact, that question was on the registration form for today's webinar. Going forward, we're going to ask that question at the end of the webinar or virtual conference in the post-conference survey that pops up at the end of the event. So for today's session, it's actually in both places. It was on the registration form and it will be in the post-conference survey as well. If you already answered it on the registration form, you don't have to answer it twice, but just be aware that the question is also in the post-event survey if you need it. Starting next month, the question will be just in the post-event survey. Now, sometimes, as you know, our webinars may run long, especially if there is a vibrant Q&A. So if that happens, you do not actually have to stay to the very end of the event to get to the post-event survey. The survey will pop up in your browser, and it will be there as long as you keep your browser open so you can come back to it at any, at any time. The CPE question is the first question uh, of the uh, post-event survey. Again, you do not have to stay to the very end of the event. The survey will pop up when you exit WebEx. And now, as for uh, reviewing HBI research on contracting, I'll be brief since we have a lot of great material to cover in today's session. If anyone is interested in reviewing HBI research and related tools on payer contracting, the Academy has collected and curated our resources in one implementation portfolio called Managing Effective Payer Contract Negotiations and Monitoring Compliance. Here we've highlighted a couple of tools, uh, the tools that we have in that portfolio. Uh, for one, HBI recently created a Senior Vice President of Revenue Cycle slash Pair Contracting Job Description, which reflects members' interest in defining the characteristics of a position that is fully equipped to negotiate optimal terms in a high-pressure environment. Also here is an excerpt from an overview presentation on contracting that we created in response to a member request. These tools and more, including the slides and recordings of the July and August webinars hosted by PMMC, are available in the portfolio on the HBI web portal. Without further ado now, let me turn it, the, uh, I'd like to just introduce our speakers today, Greg Kay of PMMC and Susan Mago of the Metro Health System. Please introduce yourselves. Thank you, Enrique. We do appreciate um, HBI support in hosting today's session. Um, and PMMC appreciates the opportunity uh, today to share some insight based upon our 30 years of experience uh, working with hospitals in the area of contract management. 
Um, our organizational focus is on accurate reimbursement calculations and leveraging that data in several areas of the revenue cycle. Um, as Enrique noted, I'm Greg Kay, Senior Vice President with PMMC. And for over the past 20 years, I've worked alongside PMMC team members to help healthcare providers maintain a balanced relationship with their payers and to constantly look for areas of improvement in the revenue cycle process by leveraging accurate expected reimbursement calculations. Uh, leading today's presentation with me is Susan Mago. Uh, Susan is the Executive Director of Managed Care with the Metro Health System in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Metro Health is the county hospital, uh, Cuyahoga County um, in Ohio, um, and Metro Health has evolved um, into an integrated delivery system with over 500 beds, uh, one of the busiest level one trauma centers in the country, uh, and other services ranging from skilled nursing facilities to over 25 healthcare delivery sites in Northeast Ohio. Um, Metro Health is constantly recognized as one of uh, the nation's leading uh, providers in meeting the needs of the entire community. Uh, Susan's role in that process is very broad and ranges from leading payer negotiations to developing managed care strategies, including population health and ACO initiatives. Um, for today, we're very fortunate uh, to have Susan um, in that Susan has a real passion for education and is on the faculty at Baldwin Wallace University. Um, and Susan, I personally thank you for being available here today. Um, to establish a baseline or a level set for today's discussion, um, PMMC's view of contract management, or if you will, the payer contract governance process, um, we take a view of there being four basic quadrants. And our session today will be focusing in on the first, or some would say the leading area, uh, which is the contract analysis or modeling component, sometimes referred to as the negotiation uh, process with contract management. Um, payer contract governance, um, as we all know, has been evolving um, over the last 40 years. Uh, it really began as the industry shifted away from charges being the sole methodology for billing and reimbursement. That goes back to CMS introducing BRG-based reimbursement, which evolved into managed care, which continues to evolve into various reimbursement methodologies today, including newer value-based or risk-managed uh, programs. Uh, but the real driver of this evolutionary process has really been around the payer and provider's uh, <coughs> focus on managing risk. Um, and the process of managing risk really comes down to two parties negotiating the risk versus reward. Susan? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> this is Susan Mago. First, let me apologize for my uh, raspy voice. I'm on the edge of laryngitis, but I'm very happy to be here. It's been my pleasure to work with Greg Kay and his team at PMMC in the past and in the present. We've done some good work together and learned some things together on how uh, technology can support the other side of negotiation, which is more of the art than the science. We do know a one-hour webinar couldn't possibly allow one to master a payer negotiation skill set, so we've prepared instead best practice-like approaches for you to consider, regardless of how much experience you have in the field. We've broken today's session into four key components. Um, probably could go eight, nine, ten, but these four seem to capture where you'd want to put your focus. Composition, what do you have to work with? Where's your starting point? Performance, how is that payer relationship performing under the current contract? 
expectations for the negotiation, and your strategy, which should drive each step of your negotiation. We're gonna pause and go through each of those with a little more detail. For the contract composition, a good starting point is to look at your options for initiating the negotiation. First and foremost, it's important to know that with any payer relationship, you can initiate a negotiation regardless of what the contract says. Those two parties can choose to change that contract when they mutually agree. So I would not uh, hesitate to, to um, set that aside as, as a, a reference, but not a rule. If you're going through a, a regular type of uh, negotiation for a renewal of rates and not looking for uh, dramatic changes, you may stay on a regular contract cycle. And in your contract, there may be notices required from one party to the other that they wish to alter something before the contract ends or before it auto renews. Again, if there's a good relationship between those two parties and they're in active communications, it shouldn't matter if you've missed that window, um, but it will matter if, if there's friction. It's always something another party could hold up to say you, you shouldn't be asking us, it's too late for the next cycle. Just something for you to think that through and to, to keep in mind. Second, all the terms of the contract, both the, both the base agreement, regardless of how old it is, it may be ancient, I realize that, and all of its amendments need to be assessed. Things that are in that contract year after year, generic language, changes that prior negotiations may have made, uh, don't necessarily have to dictate what's in your future contract. Um, that future contract is what you're designing. So see this as a, a way to look at a starting point, but not the only direction you can go. Before you did the negotiation preparation, you probably were talking internally in your organization on what's really important and where you feel burdened by payers. I don't think a day goes by that I don't hear somebody talk about those payers as if it's an us, them. It's really important in the negotiation process to, to think about what's in your contract that causes that, that feeling of burden. What's non-standard? Do you have a contract that has a one-off method that just requires an unusual amount of focus or reminders or administrative time that doesn't have to be there, but historically it's lived in the contract. This is your time. It's also a time to look at the reimbursement rate structure and the claims adjudication rules that are in the contract. Those all should be well understood and should be something that you're considering changing if it serves you. Be aware too of where you don't have control in the contract. An example is at the top of the slide, page 11. Sometimes you're paid in a relationship to the payer's proprietary schedule. They may call the fee schedule a network schedule or a plan schedule, it may be called something unique. But if they control that base schedule and you're played a multiplier of that schedule, you're exposed to whatever changes may be coming. So it behooves you to well understand how that schedule's set and what's likely to happen in the future um, because that will change your results, your revenue generated from that contract. Also important, as many of you know, is to leverage the relationship you hold with your counterpart at that payer and of course negotiate as high as possible title-wise within that pay organization. You should have been laying groundwork, ideally, throughout the year toward the moment when you would renew or, or change your contract so that it's not the first handshake you're having, it's actually now formalizing the process that you've been preparing for. Most important is, is the last point here on page 11, is doing your homework so you are in the driver's seat. Um, while two parties are in the contract, you represent your organization. You speak for them, you design this for them. So you need to know what you want to have the highest likelihood of getting there. If you're waiting to see what the other parties want so you could react, you're likely not to get where you could have been because you didn't plan that roadmap. Another tip uh, that we wanted to share here is, is to really think about this as the moment to get a fresh look at your contract. It's, a lot of moving parts to that. You may or may not have been involved personally in, in negotiating it. So think of it this way, if you were to join this organization now, fresh, a new hire in, in a negotiating role, you would take a very critical eye to that contract. You'd want to put your touch on it. You'd want to improve it to demonstrate your worth to the organization. 
It's important even in an existing job to be able to still add that value. But to add that value, you need to step back and look at the contract as objectively and as completely as possible to find the opportunities of where to negotiate. Part of finding those opportunities has to do with benchmarking the contract. What are you comparing it to? How do you know what needs to change? So I've put together here a couple of perspectives so that you're not seeing it just through your eyes or a historical reference, but against different references. And we'll go through these different examples. First, benchmark that contract against its original projections. Chances are, no matter who negotiated it, you or, or others, maybe members of your staff, that contract was, was uh, uh, modeled as, as having a certain worth, a certain revenue value to your organization. Each change of the rate last time was projected to yield a certain reimbursement. The question is, did it actually yield that? If, if it didn't, why didn't it? What surprises you in here? Does it have to do with formulas and how the rates are calculated? Perhaps you can't achieve the rates if, the, if you have a lesser of language with charges and rates. You're getting paid your charges, but the rates in the contract are irrelevant. Perhaps there's claims adjudication logic that wasn't accounted for last time, and we're, you're all very proud of whatever percent increase it was, but it's not netting that in revenue. This is the time to get that baseline established very soundly. The second is to mine that claims data and look very closely at particular services, not just the ones that are high value now, but the ones that you project to be high value next. I'm going to have Greg review a few more details with some specifics on the modeling. Greg? Uh, Greg, this is Enrique. I think your phone might be muted. Thank you, Enrique. It was. Um, so, um, as Susan noted, uh, providers uh, must do their homework, which includes modeling uh, the actual contract terms, uh, really modeling all plans, all product lines, and understanding the results in a side-by-side -side fashion. And uh, the Excel view that you see on screen, this is an example um, that um, organizations should look to incorporate, where you're taking into account uh, the various plans, uh, breaking out uh, your modeling result uh, for both inpatient and outpatient. Um, often those should be done separately. Really looking at first um, determining what data set do you want to model. And in that data set, that could be um, your historical uh, service activity with the payer that you're looking to negotiate. That could be subsets of breaking out the plan uh, component with that particular payer, um, or it could be incorporating a broader uh, set of records uh, or accounts that resemble that particular payer population. Especially when you're modeling smaller payers, you may want to go with a larger data set that would be a representative sample um, for that particular population, uh, just so that you get uh, an adequate service history in your modeling efforts. When you're doing your modeling, we typically find it important to break out and then analyze the data uh, from that service history into the actual reimbursement terms. Uh, so uh, this particular example on screen is an outpatient example uh, where we have APC reimbursement. Um, and it would group the data and sort the information based upon um, the client actual history and experience, uh, listing out the case volume, uh, the adjusted total charges. Uh, with total charges, you could include or exclude denials. Uh, that's why we list here adjusted total charges, taking out uh, denied charges from the total charge. Um, the expected reimbursement, this would be your calculated amount. The effective discount rate and then a percent of the benchmark. Uh, your first contract scenario uh, should be your benchmark. Many organizations will use um, Medicare as their benchmark. Uh, some groups, especially as they're looking at and incorporating uh, negotiating scenarios with smaller payers, uh, we're seeing a trend towards um, uh, incorporating a, a benchmark of Medicare um, 
and Blue Cross Blue Shield or Anthem. Uh, so using either of those two as your baseline. So that as you then um, move to the uh, second scenario here, this would be either your proposed contract uh, that you've received them from the payer, um, or it could be your counter proposal. And we typically see and incorporate more of a um, column side-by-side -side approach where you're taking benchmark, current, and then propose counter proposals uh, so that you have all the data lined up for an easy analysis of how that contract is performing. Obviously, when you're doing this type of side-by-side -side analysis, it's important to really understand where the financial winning and losing is occurring. That's why it's helpful to see the data at that service line level. Um, it's also important to note uh, that sometimes you can negotiate uh, different contract terms. Other times you may have to accept the new terms um, that are being proposed, depending on who the payer is. Uh, but regardless, you should be modeling to have a clear understanding of the financial impact of the new reimbursement scenarios before they actually take place or roll out um, to your organization. An example that we're seeing um, more frequently today is where state Medicaid plans are moving to new outpatient reimbursement methodologies. Um, the migration towards EAPGs uh, is one that we are seeing in a number of states, uh, Florida, Medicaid, Ohio, um, Alabama, Blue Cross are some examples of where we're seeing that migration towards new outpatient reimbursement methodology. And with Medicaid programs, uh, you may have little ability to negotiate new or different reimbursement contractual arrangements, um, but the modeling activity within that managed care or revenue integrity department should still be occurring uh, because that helps from a leadership standpoint uh, the organization to really understand and plan for that projected financial impact. Uh, as Susan noted earlier, you have to have that original benchmark to understand where you're going so that as you're uh, moving forward, you can constantly see and adjust and make sure you're making the right decisions uh, for the organization. Uh, there are other cases where you do have the ability um, to negotiate, and that modeling approach can incorporate new rates uh, as well as different reimbursement methodology changes to really ensure um, you're uh, providing your team or yourself with the knowledge of where changes should be negotiated. So at the end of the day, you end up with a true win-win <coughs> contractual arrangement uh, with your payer. Um, that's where we find it, again, so important to uh, really look to move uh, beyond just using uh, traditional Excel uh, modeling tools uh, to really calculate all of the intrinsic uh, contractual terms and rate schedules um, in presenting the data in that side-by-side -side analysis approach. Susan? Thank you. You make some really good points. You know, never are you more attuned to the details than when you're modeling that contract for the negotiation. It's great to have that be your baseline that you can reference again and again over the course of that contract's life. <clears throat> again, excuse my voice. I think it's deeper still. We're going to talk about some other benchmark methods. The one here, we're on page 15, is, is benchmarking against the current market rate. Um, two different views on that. Both you'd need to estimate, but they're extremely valuable. One is to actually look at what the payer in question reimburses your organization versus your competing providers. While those are proprietary contracts they hold with others, there are ways to buy intel on that information that gives you a feel for where those rate placements are, and there's certainly information in the market, um, but where you are compared to those. What does the payer say is their strategy for positioning your organization against their other valued providers in the network? That really matters to you and to them, and sometimes it's disregarded on the hospital or provider side because it seems like it's not our business, but it's all about this competitive positioning. Second is to actually look at that payer's reimbursement compared to how other payers reimburse you. Picture just a playing field. Do you want it entirely level? Do you want to reward certain payers for volume? What is your strategy for, for 
where those placements are. And if you don't know how they compare to each other, uh, then you, you wouldn't know how to move the given contract um, to, into its renewal. It's really important to benchmark that as well. Another benchmark has to do with looking at uh, leveling out um, the, the various methodologies into a common methodology. So convert various reimbursements to a common percentage of charge equivalent or a Medicare relativity so that you're able to see things in a like way. Your modeling can help you to do that, to model this payer's book of business on Medicare rates. Uh, or model each of your commercial or each of your Medicare books of business, you know, against the same kind of output so you're able to, to compare as apples to apples as possible and not have anomalies in there. Um, if you look at just pure rates and leave out where you have carved out services, you're not seeing the whole picture on what that contract value is. So important to benchmark that as well. You could actually picture, as I say this, probably plotting it on a diagram and deciding where the arrow should go up, down, or otherwise to adjust. Benchmarking against leadership dependencies really has to do with deciding internally before you're in the act of negotiation what this payer means to your organization. What do you need to depend on? Where are they in your payer mix now? How big a piece of the pie? What do you want that to be in the future? Where do you want to see them grow? Um, are there certain sites that you represent? Maybe you're a multi-site organization and some of your sites have a very different payer mix than others. What can you do to align those? How long a commitment do you want with this payer? Is the market changing so rapidly or the precarious relationship isn't is trustworthy that you want just to, to activate for a year or two? Or do you want to really commit long term and demonstrate a, a more serious commitment to that payer, which would cause a different kind of negotiation? Benchmarking against the overall performance is really key. And by overall, I don't mean just the overall financial. I mean everything else that has to do with the relationship with that payer. Some examples are you know, the claim payment accuracy, speed to pay, uh, how they perform on authorizations, uh, are appeals tending to be upheld or overturned, what's the frequency of their behavior on those certain events compared to their peers. They may pay well, but they pay slow. They may be one of your most valued providers, but in certain departments, there's a lot of energy spent trying to get an authorization to move a patient. Those things matter, and they should matter all year. Some of you may have scorecards you use internally. Some may use them uh, as uh, a document you share with, with your uh, payers during the year. But all those factors come in play alongside the financials for the negotiation. We have an example here, Greg, um, of, of a scorecard. I'll leave it to you. Thanks, Susan. Um, yeah, the, the first point to to keep in mind is with scorecards, uh, scorecards are, I guess, in a lot of ways like babies. Uh, they're all beautiful, uh, but some babies are a little prettier to others than, uh, so th the same thing applies with a scorecard. This particular example um, is um, pointing out several different areas and doing comparisons. Uh, there's not a right or wrong. Some organizations prefer to use um, red lights, green light, yellow light, some prefer graphs, some prefer tables. Uh, the end of the day, you need to make sure that the scorecard is giving you the relevant information that you and your team needs to make well-informed decisions. Uh, the second point uh, with scorecards is um, it, it's critical to ensure that the detailed data behind the roll-up report is accurate. Um, if, if the detailed data is not accurate, then you're going to end up with uh, making false assumptions uh, to what the scorecard's telling you. So uh, like any scorecard, um, you have to have 100% confidence in the background data uh, as you start to look at um, your particular payer scorecards and how your, your organizations are performing, um, as Susan just noted. Um, Scorecards should point to key signs, uh, market trends, sudden increases or decreases in reimbursement, uh, as well as those comparisons to benchmark statistics uh, to really kind of determine where the organization stands. Um, a few things that we often look at um, is um, both in terms of collection by payers, 
Um, what is the payer volume? Um, how does that compare uh, period to period? Uh, aligning your payers uh, to really see um, are the payers earning their discount? An effective discount rate is one um, metric, if you will, that some organizations will use so that you can ensure that the payers that uh, are producing the largest volume um, are really earning their discount. Uh, you may want to look at your recovery results uh, by organization. You may want to uh, separate out um, your results um, uh, from a graphical standpoint of collections by month. Uh, there are different ways of scoring both in terms of volume as well as underpayments. Um, in terms of underpayments, uh, we see a lot of groups breaking out denial rates uh, from contractual variance rates. Um, another is um, the percent of claims with specific reimbursement terms. Um, as you go into a new contract, you've probably modeled, and you're expecting some level of volume as it relates to outlier hits or lesser of impact scenarios or the additional reimbursement that would come from add-on uh, provisions. Um, you'd want to ensure that your scorecard, if you will, is mapping back and tracking to your goals uh, that you outlined or the benchmark that you outlined with your original simulation. Uh, so you would want to potentially include those types of uh, targets um, in your scorecard process. Susan? Thank you. The payer's reaction to those scorecards, if they're ones that you present to them or you have highlights from those that you extract and present to them, is also key to telling you what kind of relationship they want with you. So besides checking with your internal stakeholders to really check how they rank these payer relationships, again, out of your seat, looking through their eyes, is also to look through the payers' eyes, right? What is the value that you offer to that payers' network? If you are working for that health plan in that seat, trying to negotiate the, the contract with your organization, so opposite side of the negotiation table, what value do you offer them? What are you bringing to their network that someone else can't? Is it geography? Is it certain services? Is it ease of relationship? Um, is, it, is it certain access? Knowing those can help you to predict what the other party is likely to do in that negotiation and what, what's back of room uh, being talked about as they prepare. Um, it's never too soon to be listening for that and talking it through. And, and, and even if you had to make a written checklist of the, of the items that you're learning as you go through the relationship, those are all in play as you go through the preparations here. Once you have that, that baseline, you've checked yourself, you've benchmarked, it's time to establish what you want to do with this particular contract, with this negotiation. I think we're going to pause here and go through a polling question first. Thank you very much, Susan. Yes, indeed we will. Uh, so the, we'll pause for a poll and we'll also take a Q&A break. So first, we'll share the results of our first poll. As a reminder, that question was, what best describes your confidence in negotiating payer contracts at your organization? The results were 40% were confident in both strategy and tools, 21% were more confident in strategy than tools, 12% were more confident in tools than strategy, and 27% were overall not confident. Now we will launch our second in-conference poll. Are you using spare payer scorecards today to measure payer performance? The answers are yes, and we share the results with the payer, yes, but we do not share the results with the payer, or no, we do not have a scorecard process. Again, the question is, are you using payer scorecards to measure payer performance? The answers are yes and share results, yes, but do not share results, and no, we do not have a scorecard process. So now for some, uh, some Q&A. Here's a question. Uh, should we involve staff from throughout the revenue cycle in initial negotiation planning sessions? And if so, which departments might be best to include? This is Susan. Um, my, my answer is a very loud absolutely. Um, they will have perspective and data um, that 
either you won't have or you may not fully appreciate if it comes to you on a written report. The earlier folks are involved and the more welcoming you are to having them give you input on that performance uh, of the payer as you're preparing the negotiation, the better. Never too soon. Areas that are valuable is it really across the entire revenue cycle. Hopefully you're working closely already with your contract variance team to be monitoring uh, what's not performing as expected, whether you have evidence of rates being loaded incorrectly causing differentials in payment to expected reimbursement, or whether you see that uh, the, the model contract is not being uh, activated that way uh, and still under research. You'll want to have that intel and have them involved. The more comfortable you make folks as an internal planning team uh, to share that input, the, the richer the input will be. Terrific. Thanks a lot, Susan. And, and since we do have a, some more uh, ground to cover, I'll just ask one more question here. Uh, if, our, if our analytics capabilities are limited, what are the top one or two things we should benchmark to be positioned well during negotiations? Uh, so now I have to rank order those benchmarks, huh? I think uh, very important is the benchmark against the current market. The markets are changing very fast everywhere. Um, knowing you're doing well compared to your history is very narrow focused. Um, knowing you're doing well and you're, you're valued compared to what the rest of the market is enjoying from that payer is, is, is uh, priceless. Um, so I would rank that right at the top of that list. All right, that sounds, uh, sounds good, Susan. Uh, as a reminder, we will have another Q&A break in just a few minutes, but for right now, I'm going to turn the presentation back over to you, Susan. Thank you. So as we start to prepare the next step, establishing your expectations for this negotiation, by now you would have researched the contract thoroughly, but it's time to look at what parts of the payer relationship you're in. Are you included in all the networks you want to be in with that particular payer? Maybe you're negotiating a particular contract for one product line, but you're excluded historically from another. This is the time for that to be on the table. It may be unbreakable. There might be rationale that, that uh, they're doing a narrow network with one organization and you can't possibly join, but that shouldn't be something that's not talked about, not understood. Uh, and perhaps you need the same opportunity created to, to uh, develop around your relationship with the payer. Know which ones you're in, which ones you're not, why, and if you want that changed. Same thing for products or services. Um, you know, many times I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen from your experience, uh, payers are creating niche networks or carving out best practice type uh, scenarios where the business for one particular service is going only to a handful of providers, not across the whole network. If you want to be a player in that and you're excluded, you'll want that on the table for this negotiation and to really understand that maybe you didn't qualify with volume in the past, but now you do because you, you've, you've created you know, a larger um, service area than, than you had before. Second is modeling that, that uh, complete contract as we talked about. Prepare everything you know about the current contract before um, you're proceeding with crafting the various changes you want to have happen to the contract. It's important to know where you are and what you want before you're reacting to the payer's incoming proposal. It's always a, a guessing game on what serves you best, who should, who should propose first. It's likely as much as you want the contract to renew with different rates, so does the other party. But if you know what you want first, you're more likely to be able to accomplish that back to the roadmap. Um, and, and then you're, you're, you're going back to that for your comparison points instead of starting wherever the other party started the negotiation. We'll talk a little bit about anchoring shortly. Establishing your targets for certain services, all things not equal. You, you may feel very content with certain aspects of your contract, and your negotiation is all about protecting those, having them not be discussed because you want it to stay the same, and that's fabulous. But there may be other areas where you need adjustments, maybe dramatic adjustments, to become more competitive. And it doesn't matter why it's not competitive now, it, it matters that you know what you want it to be. So establish where those markers are so that you don't lose sight of it in an aggregate analysis later. A contract that goes up by the, you know, a, a, a nice a number you could be proud of, an aggregate percentage increase overall, 
um, may not have solved the problems of your organization if the services that you're planning on more volume or you're planning to be the premier provider of the network on got underserved in that negotiation. So you need to know what you want first. Determining methodology changes, we've talked about a bit earlier. Uh, don't be afraid to, to pull things out of a, a methodology that they lived in previously. That might be the only way to get the change you need. Everything else would stay constant except for this carve out that could be treated differently as its own unique rate. A different, a different kind of methodology or same methodology at different rate level. That might be the way to, to focus on those services without trying to, to demand an increase across a broader area that really wasn't necessary. And preparing for the future should also mean knowing as, as much as you can what you're likely to do in the future. Rates aside, you need to know what you're likely to do with your charge master for the near future for the, the contract term that you're negotiating. If you already know that figure, you should be including that in your contract modeling. The payer side will only know your history and they'll know what your contract allowance was for a charge master change in the past, but they won't know the way you can what's likely to be approved by your organization for the forthcoming period. So you'll want to show that. And if you're not sure, you'll want to see a range. You'll want to model with and without a possible change if the organization hasn't decided yet because those literally will result in different revenue outcomes for that contract. Be prepared to model each iteration of the counterproposals exchanged. It seems tedious, it's time consuming, but you won't know the value of each of those incremental moves unless you're letting the modeling system show you and point you to that discussion. And finally, be prepared to, to share information about your vision. If, if you know why you're pursuing something and it's not you know, tied to someone else's confidential contract, but it's tied to your strategy, share that. Help them to see what you see so they can embrace it. Give the payer the talking points to take back to their own organization as a rationale that was wrapped around your financial proposal. That there's got to be more than just, I want an increase. I want more money. The, the why matters, and it will help to create that, that story that lets them see it the way you see it, um, to see that it's the right investment because you're driving toward either correcting something that, that in the past you tolerated, um, you've been underpaid, now it's time to catch up, or to, to help them to bring patients where you're about to grow. But the more you can do that, the more you're forming a relationship which will always make for a more sound contract. I believe now we're going to pause for some more questions. Yeah, thanks very much, Susan. Uh, with that, we'll pause for our second Q&A break, but first we'll share the results of our previous in-conference poll. As a reminder, that question was, are you using payer scorecards today to measure payer performance? The results of that were 9% said yes, and they share the results with the payer. 23% said yes, but they don't share the results. And 68% said no, they do not. And now we'll launch our final in-conference poll. The question is, how are you modeling contracts today? The answers are utilizing internal staff and Excel, utilizing internal, excuse me, internal staff and decision support tools, utilizing internal staff and a contract management system, utilizing a third party organization for negotiations and modeling, or we don't model contracts. Again, that question is, how are you modeling contracts today? And the answers are internally with Excel, internally with decision support tools, internally with contract management system, third-party organization for negotiations and modeling, or we don't model contracts. So here's some uh, more questions for our Q&A. Should we share any information with payers about our desired terms before negotiations formally begin so that our time at the negotiating, ta at the negotiating table can be used most effectively? I think that's, that's wise and can um, actually grease the wheels in, in the discussion um, being productive at the table. Very good. Here's another one. If we are negotiating with a new payer or even with a new counterpart at a, a new you know, contact at the payer that we have previously uh, contracted with, what are some tips for quickly building a good rapport to support negotiations? That's a fabulous question. Um, you know, all of us have a background. All of us came from somewhere. I, I myself, I, you know, have more of my experience on the payer side than the provider side. 
So if someone asks me, I, I have stories to tell, right? I, I can talk about my career path. I can talk about things I've seen um, in, in my um, various moves across the negotiation table, and it actually starts to form, um, I, I am actually re revealing um, where I come from in my negotiation seat, if I'm, if I'm having that kind of discussion. Each person you work with um, has a background, and each person you work with probably also knows people that you know. So you start comparing, you start building a camaraderie network. Um, I, even in my case, I know there's folks I run into who literally had been my staff in the past, and now they're negotiating with me across the table because we're in payer-provider opposite relationships. Um, but there's, there's something there to build upon. So if it's there, you want to you want to you know acknowledge it. If it's not there, you want to form it. But I, I think it's much like any any um, business relationship. You you should know the people where they come from. They will they will share with you more than you expected. So you'll know um, what kind of power position they're in uh, as far as decision making. They'll share with you what's, what's going on in the organization that is important growth wise. If it's a new organization entering the market, what are their goals? How are they being measured for their success? So that you're feeding into that to help them be successful while you're getting a contract that, that meets your needs. All right, thank you very much, Susan. I think that uh, we'll leave it there for that Q&A. And as a reminder, there will be one final Q&A at the end of the presentation. And Susan, I've turned it back over to you for the home stretch. Thank you. So we'll look at a couple of things strategy-wise uh, so that your preparation pays off and, and we're thinking through uh, options. You won't be surprised to see this many of you, but it's really important to not only know what time frame you should start this negotiation so you have every confidence of resolving it, being successful, and bringing a new deal to the table without putting the patients in the middle, but you also need to be prepared to walk away. If you're so sure you're never going to leave that contract, it will exude right through your, con through your negotiation that anything's fine as long as the contract doesn't term. Knowing what is your is a deal breaker. Knowing what your walk away point is is really important. That that actually has the opposite effect. Um, and I don't mean threatening. I mean knowing it yourself that you don't lose sight of it in how you share information, how you broach the contract, how you set your various proposals. Your success level will increase because you know where that threshold is. That's internal discussion that's often hard to have. Um, there's not always leadership support. For, for getting close to the edge of a termination, but it always is a reality for these contracts. And again, many of you have much experience. Um, more often than not, even if you get across that threshold, it just exacerbates the, the relationship to the point that you can repair that before it does impact patients. But you have to know what the deal breaker is for your organization. Have that difficult discussion up front. Also, and we don't have enough time today to get too much detail into this, is knowing if the entire contract needs to change in its nature. We've designed this to be a little bit generic of a presentation that could fit a lot of different contract models. But if you're in a traditional fee-for-service model, now is the time, because you're negotiating a, you know, an amendment to a contract, to look at whether you should introduce dramatic changes. Should you, should you introduce incentives? Should you move to a risk-based structure, whether it's modest risk or, or full risk? Should you move to a narrow network offering? Should you look for a new product to be designed for you? So maybe you can't make reductions in your rate, but maybe you could if you knew you were having a narrow network built for you alongside a PPO network where you're participating among many others. This is the time to see what the, what the interest level is of that payer in designing something that you don't have now but could very well change your future. Even the tiered offerings to say, this is what I would do if I had an inner tier offering where benefits directed members toward my organization and they were wrapped with the rest of the organization. Um, no doubt the payers have been thinking that through even before you are. Uh, if you open that discussion, you may end up with an entirely different contract than just an increase to current rates you'd end up with a, a new collaboration. If you're excluded from the collaboration because they've done this with others, you'll want to know that too. Measuring internally too, your, your tolerance for that risk is important. You know, fee-for-service has traditionally been very predictable, but it's not going to remain predictable um, in the market. It, it's already changed dramatically. What is the tolerance and, and the um, capability of your organization in converting a portion of the contract uh, to guaranteed early earnings versus incentive-based earnings, where you have to perform and meet certain measures, quality measures and others, to get the rest of that 
contract increase. It's time to think about that in the back room, assess it with the payer, and, and start to convert the contracts. There it is. The page wasn't going to turn. There's also trade-offs, as you might imagine. I've covered a lot of different ways to look at this. They're all not going to move forward at the same pace. So you'll need to rank order, much like you asked me to rank order in the question, which of these issues is most important so that when you can only take it, something that covers 15 desires and 10 are really important, that you know how to rank order the 10 and you know how to stage that negotiation so you don't lose sight of the top three. If you don't know, you're not going to know how to present it in your, if they're all equal, you won't present it in your proposals in a way that features the ones that are absolutes versus uh, those that could, could sway either way in the negotiation. Really important. Picture your team at the table um, trying to write that on a whiteboard. And if the, your team can't decide, how are you going to know the contract was successful if you, if you don't even know what you want and you haven't involved the other party yet? So really important to spend some time on that, recognizing that. The other matter I referenced earlier has to do with anchoring. So if you know what you need and you've targeted that, and that's what you're striving to achieve, all throughout the organization, uh, the negotiation rather, you're going to go back to that original anchor. If you don't have that anchor, the tendency is human nature is to keep meeting in the middle, keep taking the last proposal and the last counter proposal and finding something that's a compromise. But that, that all is dependent on where the other party started. What matters to you is that you had that marker out there. You know what you were trying to achieve, but everything should be tied back to how close you are to that marker. You'll make some trade-offs. You won't achieve all of it, but you'll go back to measuring against your marker for success, not just the play back and forth between um, uh, proposals being exchanged. That could be rather dangerous. And then finally, I just wanted to stress again about the empirical data. The more you've studied this, the more the data is going to really focus you on how to go about the negotiation, which is more so a dance than, than, than anything else. It's really reacting to each other. The data will guide you. The dance will be how you start to craft uh, the speed and the nature in which you're going to achieve those goals. Your, conf your, your uh, comparisons that you've created in that contract modeling is, is a t fabulous investment. It will help you always go back to a baseline to see where I am, where did I intend to be, and where is my negotiation now. And you can measure that in increments. You'll know each trade-off you make. Everything I've said here could be said on the opposite side of the table. The payer has their needs and their increments, but you want to see when they demand and must have a certain thing, what's it worth? And is that trade-off something you can tolerate because you achieved one of your goals? But you need a way to measure, really important. And then finally, just keeping in mind it's all about that, that relationship, both near-term and, and, and long-term with the provider. What is it you want to do with this so that you know two years out that you've actually improved the relationship, not just that done a financial transaction on rates. You want to be valuable to them, more valuable in the future than you are even now. Greg? Thanks, Susan. Uh, so as we started the session uh, nearly an hour ago, um, we noted there were four key components to successful contract governance, and today we've really focused on that point number one. Um, and really for an efficient and effective contract governance process, it should include uh, several key things. Uh, first and foremost, it, it, it needs to have the ability to model all variety of payer contractual arrangements. Uh, without that on the front end, um, the second, third, fourth component of contract governance really starts to break down. Um, you need to identify your benchmarks. Uh, Susan's highlighted several of those benchmarks um, on the call today. Um, there should be an understanding of your organization's risk tolerance and your willingness to push the envelope in the payer negotiation process, and that starts with the contract modeling piece. Um, an effective and efficient contract governance process should also incorporate others. Um, I really need to commend Susan um, and her team in how they've developed a really close working relationship um, in that Dr. Boutros, um, Metro Health's president and CEO, is very involved in the negotiation process. They know the payers, they know the market, and it's a real team effort. And that goes a long ways when you sit down at the negotiating table 
because we're dealing with other people and really understanding what their needs are and where we want to end up is a real critical piece to successful contract modeling. Um, the fifth item would be really um, understanding the contractual terms and arrangements before you sign it. Uh, and this allows you to understand both the upside and the downside um, value and risk uh, that you're, you're putting the organization, uh, setting the organization up for. Um, and then lastly, um, incorporating payer scorecards in the process. Uh, that's something that gets um, a lot of comments around, uh, but obviously as we heard and saw in the, one of the poll questions, it really is still an area for uh, process improvement I think from an, a, a greater industry perspective, um, I work with someone very closely that um, always uses the comment, what gets measured gets done. And, and I think that scorecard process and the benchmark is something that um, obviously our industry needs to continue to embrace as we try to uh, improve uh, the payer contract governance process. Um, as a cyclical process, these components uh, that we've covered today and the four that are noted here really will help ensure that your governance process is always moving a step forward uh, and a step up in that cyclical process. Uh, certainly would like to uh, close with thanking Susan again for her insight and her willingness to share her experience um, as well as the, the relationship um, that we have between our two organizations. Uh, so with that, Enrique, I'll turn it back over to you uh, for the wrap-up. Thank you very much, Greg and Susan. We will do our final Q&A session now, but before, real quick, here are the results of the final in-conference poll. The question was, how are you modeling contracts today? The results were 22% said internal staff with Excel, 19% said internal staff with decision support tools, 55% said internal staff with contract management system, 4% said third party, and nobody said that they don't model. So with our final q and I'll give a couple ones here. What are some red flags that could indicate our negotiations are moving too quickly or too slowly? Greg, I answered the others. Do you want me to answer this as well? I think that was right up your alley. Okay, I didn't want to take too much of the floor. So hey, red flags is a great way to look at it. There will be signs um, right in front of you. Don't miss them. So if you have a payer who, who's not responding to your um, proposals, whether it's an overture as a verbal proposal, getting ready to send a written proposal, or you've sent and you've waited and waited for responses, something is happening at that organization. Um, you need to find out what that is, and you need dialogue to do that. Um, in fact, way back in my career, I remember people talking about um, the status of the negotiation being waiting for them to respond. And, you know, waiting isn't an action verb we should be using. Um, you know, it, we need to not just cause the pace of negotiation, but know what those, those pauses mean. Um, when they're assessing, are they having trouble with their data? Are they, I mean, they can't jive your numbers because something's wrong. They're not skilled. They don't, they're not there's some contradiction. Is it because you're distracted with something that literally could be leaving you out? They're, they're building something that excludes you and it's more important than your deal right now. If there's a clock ticking on this contract to renew and the engagement isn't there, that's a huge red sign. Um, another one would be when, when um, you're talking about the same numbers but you're, you're not representing it as the same results. Um, it's, it's very rare for a payer and a provider to have the same analysis outcome, but they should be similar. They should be directional. Um, if you can help the payer to use the same uh, time frame for their data set, you could put some of that to rest because you grab the same set of data with sufficient run out to represent you know, a prior year period. Um, but if it's still not jiving, there's something else there and it's worth undoing that to find out. Um, a third one I would just say has to do with um, projections. If you're, if you're seeing, seeing that everything looks yesable, um, it's probably because the payer, and, and the payer is not seeing it that way, they're probably putting something else into your future vision that, that you're not aware of. Um, they're presuming something, and you'll need more dialogue to do that. Um, and when the dialogue happens before or after you're exchanging these proposals, all really depends on that relationship and how uh, forthcoming folks are. But it's very important. All right, thank you, Susan. And I know we're closing in on the top of the hour. I'm just going to squeeze one more in, and that is, what are common signs that it's time to walk away from the negotiating table and terminate a contract? Yeah. 
So certainly not something to be taken lightly, but definitely always an option for you. Um, if it becomes offensive, um, literally a take it or leave it um, kind of message is given to you and you know it's not important, um, be ready to make that move, but don't do it without analyzing the impact of the termination. You'll want to run an analysis on what would happen if this contract no longer was in their network. What amount of business would you lose? Um, how would that business who comes in anyway be paid? Do you have a market where you have a lot of HMOs? Do they tend to have out-of-network benefit levels in place for POS or PPO type clients? What, what would the financial results of that be? So you know if it makes sense. All right, thank you very much, Susan, and I think uh, we'll leave it there. So uh, thank you again, Greg and Susan, and thank you all for attending today's Thought Leadership Webinar hosted by PMMC, How to Negotiate with Payers, the Four Key Components of Contracting. Please join us uh, for our next Revenue Cycle Academy virtual conference coming up, Designing a Modern Billing Statement, a Case Study in Leveraging Patient and Staff Feedback, which you can register for at the events page of our web portal. Thanks again, and have a great rest of the week.